good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. And let me begin by thanking the organizers of this event for bringing all of us together and allowing me to participate. And my paper today looks at the relationship between Moroccan nationalists and US diplomats during the post-Second World War period. The official homepage of the US Embassy in Rabat celebrates the history of US-Moroccan relations, especially highlights such as the meeting between Franklin D. Roosevelt and Sultan Mohammed bin Yusuf on the sidelines of the ANFA conference in January 1943, as well as Dwight D. Eisenhower's recognition of Moroccan independence in March 1956. However, the period in between these two dates is summarized in only 20 words. Quote, following World War II and after more than a decade of struggle, Morocco attained its independence from France in 1956. This absence of details might surprise us, given that these were formative years of Moroccan history that culminated in the abolishment of the French and Spanish protectorates. What might explain this void? And how did U.S.-Moroccan relations develop during this period? In my presentation today, I will show that the U.S. refused to actively support the Moroccan quest for independence. Driven at first by the open racism of its diplomatic agents in the field, and then constrained by so-called geopolitical considerations, the State Department never put any real pressure on France to fundamentally change its policies in Morocco. Nonetheless, following the end of the war, U.S. diplomatic agents actively engaged with the leaders of the nationalist movement through regular personal meetings to stay informed about the situation on the ground. And even though this engagement policy did not change Washington's official stance on the issue, it created strong personal relations between the American officials and the kingdom's future political elites, thereby laying the foundation for the close U.S.-Moroccan alliance that took shape in the post-independence and early Cold War era. Throughout World War II, U.S. foreign policy had a single goal, to support the Allies' campaign against the Axis power. Everything else was of secondary importance, including the political aspirations of anti-colonial independence movements. Furthermore, American diplomats stationed in Morocco displayed, a very, displayed very rigid ideas about racial hierarchies and social progress, which shaped the views of the local population. In May 1940, amidst increasing demands for an end to the protectorate regimes, Mr. Gould, the consul general in Casablanca, proclaimed to have observed that, quote, the natives are incapable of government themselves and that the aid of a foreign power is essential. He then added that, quote, the more, like most Muslims, worships strength and was thus allegedly always looking for, quote, master to rule over him. In particular, the highest-ranking American official in Morocco, James Rives Childs, had little patience for any political demands made by the Moroccans. According to his assessment in September 1944, Moroccan nationalism has no broad basis of appeal at the present time, as nationalism in advanced countries such as Syria, Palestine, Iraq, and Egypt. The agitation of a comparative few is being taken advantage of by ambitious, and in many cases, utterly unscrupulous, feudal-minded Moroccans to gain greater control in order to better exploit country and people. A few months prior, he had defended French rule as highly appropriate. Quote, when ignorant and emotional busybodies prattle about the wrongs done to the Moroccan people by the French, they should visit the South and see for themselves what Moroccan rule has done in improving the lot of the people and in checking the rapacity of the kites and pashas, he commented. Following several conversations on this topic, his superiors at the State Department concluded that, at least according to Childs, quote, to speak of extending self-government to the Moors in our generation is to invite a return to chaos, anarchy, and corruption. U.S. intelligence agents conducting reconnaissance in Morocco during the war years under the guise of the murphy Wagon Agreement of 1941 offered a much more nuanced description of the general situation in Morocco. One of them, Kenneth Pandar, reported that, quote, the Arabs feel that the worldwide war will give them a way of throwing off once and for all this kind of domination. Yet this might actually align with U.S. interests since, quote, the Moors have, a great, have great respect and admiration for the Anglo-Saxon world, 
His colleague Gordon Brown reported that, quote, all Rifians and other Muslims in the Spanish zone like America and admit it. They have heard of our freedom of action and of our education, which they would like to have themselves. They know very little about America and have seen few Americans. America is far away. One year later, Brown advocated much more forcefully on behalf of the local anti-colonial movement. Quote, if the U.S. shows no interest in the problem of Moroccan Muslims, the 8 million population will turn strongly against us. The unfortunate and sadistic French policy in Tunisia will become well known throughout Morocco and the Arab world. The landing of the U.S. Army across North Africa in November 1942 raised considerable hopes among some Moroccans who, who viewed the new arrivals as potential saviors. As the head of the newly established Istiklal Party, explained in a letter submitted to the U.S. Consulate in Rabat on November 8, 1944, quote, To commemorate the anniversary of the day on which the first wave of the forces of liberty landed on our territory is equivalent for us Moroccans to the celebration of the beginning of the end of a bad dream. The U.S. diplomats did not enjoy their newfound role as they remained staunchly opposed to meddling in French colonial affairs, but they nonetheless increased their engagement with the Muslim population and slowly gained a much better understanding of the local political landscape. A report filed from Rabat in April 1944, for example, clarified that, quote, the majority of nationalist leaders and sympathizers are not pro-Axis while also acknowledging that, quote, there is definite brutality on the part of the French toward the natives. While the attitude of individual American diplomats toward the Moroccan nationalists steadily evolved after the end of the war, official U.S. policy toward French Morocco remained unchanged. Immediately following the outbreak of the Sitif massacre uh, on May 8, 1945, the consulate in Casablanca made it absolutely clear that, quote, whatever may be our attitude toward nationalist aspirations in French North Africa, our air communications to the east are of such vital importance that no uh, internal disturbances should be permitted to threaten the smooth functioning. He thus did not object to a French request to use Joint Air Transport Command resources to fly 200 troops to eastern Algeria to repress the uprising. The same diplomat also assured his superiors that, quote, the legation at Tangier and this consulate have repeatedly made it known to the nationalists in Morocco that this is no time to make a break for liberty. Even after the departure of Childs in June 1945, the general tenor in the dispatches from Morocco to Washington did not fundamentally change. Following an appeal by the Moroccan Unity Party, quote, for the application of democracy as embodied in the Atlantic Charter, end quote, John Goodyear, the legation's third secretary, promptly dismissed this, quote, fallacious desire. In 1946, Consul Maurice Pasquet opined that, quote, it would take 30 years or more to prepare Morocco for self-government. A few months later, he called the nationalist movement, quote, a destructive rather than a constructive force, which he blamed on its leaders, quote, a lack of mental equipment, talent, capacity for constructive work, and endowment of good sense. Consul General Charles W. Lewis Jr. added that, quote, one has the feeling that before the Moroccan talks, over much of liberty and independence, he might give some evidence of a desire to mend his own way of life. His dress and his speech will meanwhile but superficially cloak a historical aptitude for tyranny. Such sentiments were widely shared among Moroccan American diplomats at that time. But this should not make us overlook the fact that they had also started to gain a much more nuanced understanding of the nationalist activities, especially their goal to mobilize support both domestically and internationally uh, in support of immediate independence. While still often quite unsympathetic in their assessments, they at least kept, clo kept close tabs on the political scene. Child's direct successor in Tangier, Paul H. Alling, showed himself to be a much more nuanced observer of Moroccan politics, regularly meeting with nationalist leaders to assess their plans. He particularly enjoyed the company of the Istiklal Secretary General, Ahmed Benafrej, whom he called, quote, the most intelligent and moderate of the Moroccan nationalist leaders. In 
Following an audience with Sultan Muhammad ben Yusuf during the latter's famous visit to Tangier in April 1947, Allen described the monarch as, quote, an alert, intelligent man seeking to improve the situation and standard of living of his people. The personal contacts between American diplomats and Moroccan nationalists increased dramatically in subsequent years. The new chief of the Tangier legation, Edwin A. Plitt, regularly communicated with the Sultan by way of envoys and did not hesitate to invite Abdel Kharid Torres and the brothers Tayyip and Mehdi Benouna from the party of national reform, Hizb al-Islah al-Watani, which was based in Spanish Morocco, for a soiree. Quote, the three Moroccans did not hesitate to drink several whiskies prior to dinner, he noted in a subsequent memo. Such meetings were meant as opportunities for diplomats to gouge the political atmosphere in their host country and fail to yield the explicit US backing of Moroccan independence that the nationalists desired. In a lengthy report on the topic, Consul Robert H. McBride commented that, quote, The Istiklal is understandably depressed at their realization that we are not going to do anything of material help to them. Nonetheless, their, quote, pro-American attitude, as he put it, had not waned. At the same time, though, a new generation of diplomats began to show itself much more th sympathetic toward the demands of uh, for Moroccan independence. Particularly outspoken was Robert T. Cohen, U.S. Consul in Casablanca, after the Istiklal had submitted a complaint to the French Resident General Eric Labon denouncing his repressive policies, Cohen informed the State Department that he, quote, would like to go on record as stating that the report is not exaggerated and that the grievances unquestionably are true. France is obviously determined to turn this protectorate into a colony, even if it necessitates treating the Moroccans as the Germans treated the French during the German occupation of France. In the summer of 1946, he went so far as to predict a, quote, revolt and, quote, bloodshed very soon, quote, unless radical changes are made. His proposed solution was the, quote, immediate withdrawal of our recognition of France's protectorate rights. However, such radical assessments were not widely, widely shared during the immediate post-war period. Alling, for example, dismissed Cohen's report, claiming that he had fraternized with, quote, rather extreme Moroccan nationalists, and that thus, quote, his views are naturally colored by that influence. By the beginning of the 1950s, the State Department sought to improve its knowledge of the situation in Morocco and thus increased its outreach efforts. In November 1950, Assistant Secretary of State George C. McGee and the head of the Tanger legation, Plitt, had a long audience with the Sultan, during which both sides assured each other of the importance of his market friendship. However, McGee also reminded his host that, quote, our traditional friendship with France must not be forgotten, and that, quote, cooperation between the Moroccans and the French in the domain of economic, education, and social progress had been of inestimable benefit to Morocco. Although the U.S., quote, considered Islam a very important barrier against communism, end quote, it could not afford to offend its ally just as the Cold War was beginning to define world politics. During a meeting with Bella Fresh in 1953, Plitt, quote, quote, took the opportunity once more to remind him of our long-standing friendly relations with France and our obligations to France as an ally in the NATO organization. Despite such increased contacts between Moroccans and American officials, U.S. foreign policy toward the North African Kingdom evolved at glacial speed. According to a State Department memo from July 1950, our primary objective is the maintenance of a peaceful and stable, uh, peaceful and stable conditions under a regime which is friendly to the U.S. due to the country's, quote, strategic geographical position. This apparently precluded any support for the local anti-colonial movement. The report's authors acknowledged that, quote, we have therefore avoided putting pressure on France by giving aid and comfort to the natives directly, although we maintain open contact with them and consider their friendship and goodwill very important. Another memo published exactly four years later showed little change regarding this attitude as the Eisenhower administration had replaced the Truman White House. Although pressured by their allies at the UN to take a more forceful stance, and despite acknowledging their disappointment about France's unwillingness to implement any reforms in Morocco, State Department officials concluded that, quote, given the present situation in Europe, 
It still is least dangerous for the immediate future to continue the present line, though with the U.S. passing from a passive role, where we have not influenced developments, to a more active one. Only by early 1955, just one year prior to the Kingdom's independence, did the legation finally advise a change of course. Referring to the U.S. support of France during recent debates at the U.N., new acting diplomatic agent Joseph C. Satterthwaite warned that, quote, if repeated in the future, this undoubtedly contributes to further loss of American prestige in this country, as well as in Africa and Asia. The lack of American support greatly disappointed the Moroccans, who had put a lot of uh, their hopes in the new superpower. Various diplomats sensed that, quote, Moroccan public opinion had become increasingly hostile toward their country. The nationalist press repeatedly published articles attacking the government in Washington. Rabat-based consul Robert H. McBride noted that, quote, this office, which is the primary contact with these elements, is finding its task increasingly difficult and the tendency to despair of the U.S. very widespread. Yet none of this disappointment ever completely undermined the standing of the U.S. According to a dispatch from the Tangier legation in the summer of 1952, quote, the Sultan, as well as the bulk of the Istiqlal leaders, continue to place their best hopes in the U.S., and to feel that in the long run it'll be through the intervention or good offices of the U.S. that Morocco will progress towards independence. Genuine ideological affinities, as well as the absence of credible alternatives, meant that America remained in good standing among the Moroccan elites until the eve of independence. By the time Morocco finally obtained its independence in March 1956, three successive U.S. administrations had contributed little to this development. Nonetheless, the policy of engagement adopted by the U.S. following the end of the Second World War had borne fruit, as the personal relationships established during these years carried, carried over into the post-independence era. The former nationalists, who now formed the core of the kingdom's political class, viewed the United States as the principal ally in stabilizing and modernizing the newly independent country. For example, in the fall of 56, the embassy in Rabat reported on recent meetings with Moroccan leaders whose, quote, solicitation of U.S. friendship and aid reflect generally present Moroccan trust and hope in the U.S. willingness to assist their country in attaining internal stability. We can thus conclude that the assumption that the U.S. was a principal ally of the Moroccan people in their fight for independence would be incorrect. This explains the void in the brief synopsis of U.S.-Moroccan relations that can be found on the homepage of the U.S. Embassy in Rabat. Nonetheless, the informal bilateral relations that developed between Moroccans and American officials at the height of the liberation struggle laid the groundwork for the strong alliance between the two countries that persists until today. Thank you very much.